Welcome. Hope you're enjoying the sunshine. We're going to open up with a song this morning. Today is Intern Sunday. I have two of my interns up here helping lead worship.
Praise God. <laughs> That's so fun, and I'm so out of shape. <laughs> of your panting. Um, <laughs> Happy St. Patrick's Day, everybody. How many of you forgot to wear green? <laughs> Well, I put green on this morning, forgetting it was St. Patrick's Day, so the Holy Spirit went before me. <laughs> um, so I'm so happy to see you all. Um, let's direct our attention to the screen for some announcements. Hi, Hope. It's Chad here with this week's announcements. The annual members meeting is scheduled for today after service. It will be a recap of how the church did and what it did in 2023 and it will include some financial updates as well. We are happy to announce the completion of a recent update to the Hope CC app and a resolution to some technical issues that are now resolved. This update ultimately fixed the link to the app stores and notifications, as some of you may have noticed, specifically us Apple users. Aside from that, the only other major change you will see is that the featured Hope logo is now seen as white within the app store. I do recommend that you take some time to go to your phone's app store and update the app. However, I don't think there are any crucial updates that changed. If you continue to use the version you already have, it will function as normal without the update. The Kids Club meets one evening a month and each gathering has a different theme and activity. Registration can be found in the HOPE website under the Kids Ministry tab and also on the events page. Normally the cost is only $10 per child per evening. This month, the Kids Club meets on two evenings and the dates are free at no cost as the focus is on Easter and Easter program rehearsals as well as other fun activities. If you have any questions, please seek out Pastor Heather. At the end of March this year, we have Good Friday and Easter services. We start this year's Easter weekend with our Good Friday service on March 29th and we encourage you to attend and invite others. This evening service starts at 6.30 p.m. Then on Sunday, we will celebrate Easter here at Hope with two services at 8.45 a.m. and 11 a.m. with Kids Church available at the 11 o'clock service. So invite your neighbors, friends, and come celebrate that we are risen with Christ. There are various ways you can give an offering here at Hope, and you can give in your Hope CCI or online through our website. Or you can drop an envelope in the offering boxes at the back of the sanctuary or in the foyer. If you're visiting, you'll also find connect cards in the back of the seats. We invite you to fill them out, and we'd love to reach out and connect with you. You can drop it into one of the offering boxes, or bring that to Marjorie in the foyer, where she'd love to welcome you to Hope, and offer you a free welcome drink for you and your entire family from the Stirring Coffee House downstairs. We're glad you're with us today. To learn more about any of these events or available ministries at Hope, please check the Hope CC app or visit our website hope-christian.com Amen. And, uh, one, more one, sorry, one more announcement is that uh, there will be no Sunday evening service on Easter. So just to let everybody know. So one of the ministries that I run here at Hope is called Sozo Ministry. And uh, in Sozo, it is a, about a two, one and a half to two hour session where we look at lies that maybe you have learned in your life that have turned into limiting beliefs. Um, they've limited you in your relationship with God and your relationship with others, um, your ability to um, experience freedom and wholeness. So we go after uh, strongholds and lies and most people leave a Sozo session feeling lighter, more joyful, more connected with the Lord, and um, it's been such a beautiful ministry, such a gift um, to be able to minister Sozo. And so I have a beautiful Sozo team. If you're part of my team at all, can you stand right now? Amen. Amen. Yeah, there are there are a few who aren't here today, but um, but so. I love this team so much, and it really is a team effort. Um, in the room, there is a, the person operating the Sozo is called First Chair. And for the last couple years, um, the First Chairs have been Debbie Alexander and myself. And um, I have a few ladies today who I'm going to introduce to you in a moment who have worked really hard for two years um, at least 
to develop these skills, to learn to flow with Holy Spirit, um, to draw people into places of freedom. And they have recently been promoted into first chair. So I would like to invite them up right now. Kathleen Pfaff. <laughs> Margie Lawrence and Jan Shonsby. Thank you, Lord. Okay. I just want to honor these ladies in front of you, and I'm going to invite Debbie, my other first chair, to come join us to just pray over these ladies. Um, I just want to honor these ladies for all of the hours and hours and hours and prayer and intercession and learning that they have put into this ministry. I know that, um, that they are so anointed and the Lord's so going to use them. So let's just pray over them. If you could reach your hand toward them. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Lord, I just thank you for Kathleen, for Margie, and for Jan. Lord, I thank you for the yes in their hearts for you. I thank you, Lord, that they have the heart of sozo which means saved healed delivered they want to see people saved completely healed completely delivered restored broken free from the prisons that they've been bound in lord jesus i thank you lord for an extra measure of anointing of hearing your voice lord sensitivity to your spirit and um lord that they would go farther than uh, debbie or i have even gone lord that they would, we would see so many people led into healing and freedom in the name of Jesus. Lord Jesus, we just thank you so much for, for the heart behind each one of these ladies, Lord, that they have poured into learning, Lord God, to know your voice, to hear what you're saying, and to let you lead them, Lord. And I just pray that, God, as they, as they go forward, as they take these gifts that you've given them, Lord, and minister them out to those um, that they're doing sozo with, Lord God, I just pray that you would bless them in their lives, Lord, that there would be a greater yielding to your Holy Spirit in every way, Lord God, and that your presence, your spirit would go before them, surround them, and cover them behind, Lord Jesus. We just bless everything you're calling them into and the works of their hands. Amen. Amen. Thank you, ladies. We bless you. If you are interested in signing up for a SOZO session, you can do so online under uh, Ministries. You'll find a link to the SOZO ministry, and we'd love to get you scheduled for a SOZO. So with that, let's stand with me, and let's thank the Lord for our offering today. Lord, we just bless you. We thank you that you are, are the Father who provides. You have withheld no good thing from your children, and so we gladly pour forth into you, into your kingdom. We come against every lie that says there's not enough or there's not lack or that you have to hoard or you're going to go without, Lord. We just break every hoarding spirit, every spirit of lack right now. And I thank you, Lord, that you are the God who gives, that you are generous. And so, Lord, we just open our arms to give to you this morning in every way that you ask, every way that... that um, yeah, that life would just pour forth from us in every way. So we bless this offering today and pray that it just multiplies your kingdom on this earth. Thank you, Lord. We worship you, Jesus. We just turn our hearts to you right now and worship. We bless you, Lord. You are so worthy. You are so good, Lord. I just feel overflowing with thankfulness this morning for all of your goodness. Thank you, Lord. We put every burden at the foot of the cross right now. And we just turn our hearts in thanks and praise to you, Lord. Thank you, God.
thank you, Lord. Thank you, God, for all that you are, for all that you've done, and all that's to come, Lord. Awake my soul and sing, sing his praise aloud, sing his praise
blazing sun shall pierce the night, and I will rise among the saints, my gaze transfixed on oh, Jesus' life in your name 
We are raised to life again Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, God. There is power, power, wonder work, power. It's here today in the room. The Spirit of Christ is here. He's working amongst us. He's healing our bodies. He's touching our minds. Thank you, Lord. And you restore, you renew. This is what you do. Jesus, Jesus. Jesus, Jesus. We love you, we love you. What a beautiful name it is. What a beautiful name it is. The name of Jesus Christ our King. What a beautiful name it is. Nothing compares to this. What a beautiful name it is. The name of what a wonderful name. What a wonderful name it is. What a wonderful name it is. Of the name of Jesus Christ our King. What a wonderful name it is. Nothing compares to this. What a wonderful name it is. The name of Jesus. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. beauty for ashes and you give us life in the barren land and you give us joy for our morning you make things new sing that again and you give us beauty for ashes and you give us life in the barren land and you give us joy for our morning you make things new you restore you renew this is what
clean heart, renew our minds and spirits, purify, conform us in your
just get a picture of when Adam and Eve had sinned and they were hiding. And the Lord was calling out to them in the garden. And they were hiding. And Adam and Eve felt exposed. I just feel like the Lord um, is, is touching your life in, in, a, in such a way this morning where you're feeling a little bit vulnerable, but, but God is so safe. Don't be afraid. Don't be afraid. Come out. Come out into the open, whatever that means. Stop hiding. Come into the light of his glory. He's so wonderful. Step into the light this morning. Step into the light this morning. No more hiding, no more hiding. You can trust him. Thank you, Lord. Lord, thank you, Jesus. I just want to provide a mo moment of response before we move on. And oh, I'm running to your arms. I'm running to your arms. The riches of your love will always be enough. Nothing compares to your embrace. The light of the world forever rain. I'm running to your arms. I'm running to your arms. The riches of your love will always be enough. Nothing compares to your embrace. The light of the world Forever rings. Forever rings. 
step into the light I step into your grace Do your arms open wide To feel your embrace Cause how deep the Father's love How deep the Father's love And of his Son in the Spirit No greater love In Colossians, Paul talks about being hidden with Christ in God. The enemy would love for you to be hidden with him, but Jesus calls out and says, be hidden with me. He says, I paid the price so that you could be hidden with me. Wrapped in me. Sam, as we were worshiping, Sam, I got the same word that Pastor Barry gave, that God's calling you out of the hiding. He's calling you out of the, out of the blending in that the enemy would like to keep you in. He's calling you up. And you have no idea yet what he's called you to but it's an incredible calling. The enemy would like for you to keep held back, but God is saying this is the time you've been called for this time. He's calling you higher. God, we thank you for Sam. God, we thank you for the man of God that you've made him to be. We thank you for the radical price you paid for his life. We thank you for the giftings and callings over his life that are irrevocable. We thank you that you've gone before him, you've made a way, that he can walk in your victory, God. I pray that you take him into the heights of all that you have for him. I pray that you blow his mind with things that he would have never imagined for his own life. I thank you that you're calling him right now saying, you're called for this. This is the time. You are made for such a time as this. God, I thank you that you're speaking over Sam's life, and I pray your spirit upon him in Jesus' name. And Bijou, I got this picture that the Lord has crafted a new boat for you. 
He's been calling you on a new adventure, but you've been in the old boat. And he's crafted a new boat for you. Specifically for you. The enemy has no claim on your life. The enemy has no claim on your life. You walk free. You're on adventure with him. Jesus, I thank you for Bijou. I thank you that she is your daughter. You've adopted her. You've brought her close. She can walk in the newness of life that you paid for through Jesus. That you've equipped her for everything she needs in this season. You've equipped her for every step and every decision. I think that you've prepared beforehand things that she hasn't even thought of yet. Things that she needs that she doesn't even know. You've prepared beforehand everything she needs for this season, for this journey with you. I pray your anointing and your favor, the presence of Jesus over her in Jesus' name. I don't remember your name right behind you, Conrad. I just feel like the Lord, the Lord says you are precious to him. He sees you when it's just you and him. He sees you when you sit in his presence and you move his heart. You move his heart. What was your name? Matsi. Jesus, we thank you for Matsi. Thank you that you're holding her close. I thank you that your heart burns for her. That you see those moments when nobody else sees. You see the posture of her heart when it's just you and her. I pray that you would take her deeper. God, that you give her a glimpse of your heart. Would you give her a glimpse of how she moves your heart, God? Take her deeper, God, in Jesus' name. Amen. I'm going to have a few people come up and give testimonies. If Joseph, Millie, and Cricket, if you want to come up with Millie. We'll start with Millie. Well, last Sunday night, what Beverly was here, she called a bunch of people up to be delivered, and I came up, and she was praying over me, and I felt like something, I was coughing something up, something was coming up, and it got lodged in my throat, so it was stuck, so I went outside with Cricket and Cricket started praying over me, and the anointing of God just took me off my feet, and I fell backwards. And Cricket, thank, thankfully, Cricket was behind me and caught me. <laughs> um, but uh, and something did come out, um, and when it left, I felt the Holy Spirit fully come back in and take me away, and it just, the power of God is surreal, it's real. Amen. Hallelujah. Amen. I'm so happy for you, my dear sister. There's more. There's more in store for you. Amen. Um, Pastor wanted me to share this uh, testimony. First of all, I want to say thank you to all the intercessors of the house. To God be the glory. Thank you to everyone that is praying. To God be the glory. Thank you, Pastor, for your leadership. You know, we are seeing it out there. Those of us that go out and, you know, evangelize and minister, we are seeing out there. Good to see you. You look so good. <laughs> Amen. Um, we are seeing it out there. And a few weeks ago, so we've been going out every Friday night uh, to the Buren Transit Center to evangelize and minister. And a few weeks ago, 
when we got there, um, there was hardly anybody there. And we felt God saying, just begin to share the gospel, share the gospel of salvation. And there was nobody there, so it was like, who are we preaching to, right? But we're like, well, we'll just share it to see the ground with the gospel. So we began to share. Then a gentleman walked up. He was leaning on a stick. And he began, like, he was listening. He was listening. Then he would walk and then come back, walk and come back. And as we were sharing, you know, we'll look at him and, you know, speak to him directly about God's love for him. Anyway, to cut it short, eventually he goes by where we had our table with the coffee and stuff, opens his jacket, takes off his bag, and then he starts crying. He, he began just weeping. He's like, I don't know what it is why I'm crying, but what you're saying, what you're saying is making me cry. Then he opens his bag and he takes out the, this huge bottle of, of liquor. And he begins to pour it away while he's crying. So he's pouring the liquor away. And then he takes out a pack of cigarettes, starts throwing them on the ground. When that was done, he opens a compartment of his bag, takes out another pack of cigarettes, throws it away. And then we prayed for him that, you know, for deliverance. And, you know, he invited Jesus into his heart. And what was really striking was the power of the gospel. You know, we didn't go there like with the notes prepared or anything like that. We just got there and God said, just share the simplicity of the gospel. And Jesus did his thing. And, you know, to God be the glory. So, and I know it's on the backs of all the prayers that you guys are praying. Amen. We've got one more testimony. I'm going to bring it to her. Do you mind if I jump on? So um, I've been really sick with a bladder infection for a few months and got a lot of prayer here. Thank you, all that prayed. But it, just, it wasn't going away. The doctor gave me all different kinds of medicine. It was terrible. One time I threw up during the night. and I, I, I had really bad uh, uh, dehydration. Even though I drank a lot of water, it wasn't doing any good. And... Um, and uh, I fainted twice, uh, fell on the floor. Oh, Dennis pulled me up. <laughs> I, I just went through a lot of misery for over two months. And it's one of the worst things I've been through in my life. It was really, I, oh, I, I forgot to tell you. Meanwhile, during this time, I got a really bad flu, too. And that made it worse, of course. So um, uh, I, I got a lot of prayer for it. And then we had this prayer meeting on, uh, well, after the service on Sunday morning, then they asked us to come up and pray. And I went up in the front row, and Glenn came over and prayed for me. And I felt the Lord was touching me, but I didn't know he was being healed because he touches me sometimes. And uh, so uh, uh, I, the, the doctor prescribed some new medicine m meanwhile during this last few days. And, and I thought, I'm not going to take that horrible stuff. I'm just not going to do it. I'm backing up a little bit. I told you I wasn't very good at this kind of testimony, but he made me do it back here. <laughs> so, um, oh, um, now I lost my train of thought. <laughs> so anyway, uh, when I went back to the doctor, uh, he said, oh, you don't have you don't have any more, and I'm going, yay, I'm jumping up and down, I'm so happy. And he thinks the medicine did it, but I really hadn't taken any the last week. <laughs> so anyway, God to God be the glory because I'm my body's still kind of recuperating. But God healed me. He can do anything. We we think he's never gonna come. We get prayer and prayer and prayer, but don't give up. Yeah. He touched me. Thank you, Jesus. Yeah. Amen. Amen. Love those testimonies. Get it for Randy. We're stepping into 
a distinct time, a distinct season. There are certain times of seasons that are in preparation, certain times and seasons that are foundational. But I believe that we've stepped into a Cairo season. There are some different Greek words for time, and sometimes they're translated all as time, and they're actually not synonyms. They're actually not exactly the same. A Cairo season is a distinct, opportune time, a harvest time, a window of opportunity. I believe that we've entered into a Cairo season here in the city. The city is ripening. The ground is softening. The Seattle freeze is melting. We have the opportunity to either press in to the harvest that God desires, or we can allow the status quo, we can allow the inertia of the current cycle and culture to continue on. But we're in a distinct season where the body of Christ has the opportunity to decide to usher heaven into earth like we've been commissioned to do. Let's read from Romans 13, starting in verse 11. In this passage... Paul just got done saying that essentially love is the fulfillment of the law. He goes through and he talks about do not commit an adultery, do not murder, do not steal, do not covet. All of those are fulfilled by love. It's like when Jesus summarized all the law and the prophets. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength and love your neighbor as yourself. Love is the fulfillment of the law. He just got done explaining that. And he goes on and says, besides this, you know the time that the hour has come for you to wake from sleep. For salvation is nearer to us now than when we first believed. The night is far gone. The day is at hand. So then let us cast off the works of darkness and put on the armor of light. He says, besides this, you know the time. It's that root word, kairos. You know the time, a distinct time, an opportune time. I believe we stepped into a Kairos moment here in Seattle. And you might say, Pastor Seth, you haven't been here that long. You don't realize what we've seen. You don't realize the hope we've had in the past that was broken or unfulfilled. You don't realize how long this has been going on. You don't realize that it's been decades of slipping and sliding down the path this city's been on. You're right, I haven't been here that long. I might not fully understand. But maybe that's why God brought me here. Maybe that's why God brought someone that hasn't been in ministry, that has no historic reference of the way things should go. Because I look around, I've been here two years, I look around, and even in these two years, I see God moving. I see things shifting. I see the Kairos moment that we've stepped into. And we have the opportunity to press into it fully. God desires that we would take this opportunity and we would participate with him in the harvest that he desires in this city. There are multiple Greek words that are translated as time in the New Testament. We're going to talk about two of them today. Kronos and Kairos. We're going to read from Acts 3, 19. You can pull there in your Bibles. We'll look at each one that's displayed in this passage. So here in Acts 3, it's right after Peter and John have seen a man healed through the power of Jesus outside the gate of the temple. A lame man that had been there for his whole life got up and walked, and he went into the temple, 
And everybody sees him and recognizes what's just happened. There were probably people in that temple that walked by him all the time, were familiar with him, had maybe given him money and, as he was begging for years and years and years. He comes walking into the temple. And a crowd gathers, and Peter begins to preach the gospel. And after he begins preaching the gospel, he gets to verse 19 where he says, Repent, therefore, and turn back, that your sins may be blotted out, that the times of refreshing may come from the presence of the Lord, and that he may send the Christ appointed to you, Jesus, whom heaven must receive until the time for restoring all things, about which God spoke by the mouth of his holy prophets long ago. Dutch Sheets loves to talk about these words for time in the Greek. He writes about it as well. Chronos. Think of like chronology, chronological. It's the general routine standard of time. It could be a moment, it could be a season, but it's the general function of time. This happened at this time. It starts and ends in literal form. It could be a year, it could be decades. But it's a general season of time. If you're a farmer, it's the time that you spend preparing the ground, laying the seed, watering, tending. It's not harvest time yet, but it's very necessary for harvest time. Kronos, the general routine seasons of time. We haven't gotten to the 30, 60, 100 fold. We haven't gotten to the great har harvest. It's not in the barn yet. But time is going by and important things are happening. Foundations are being laid. Kronos. In this passage of Acts 3, it talks about times for restoring. Restoring is the Greek word apokatastasis, which literally means to reconstitute something. To reconstitute something. A constitution is the way something was made or meant to operate. So the constitution of a business is how it's meant to operate. How it runs. The constitution of your body is how your body functions. The constitution of a company is how that country is supposed to operate. So apokatastasis, these times of restoring, Peter is saying that there's these times where the earth is going to be reconstituted. It's going to move from an old process to a new process, a new way of operating, a new way of running, heaven coming to earth. Times of restoring. But he uses that root word, chronos. The times of restoring, the chronos of restoring. That there's important things in the process of restoring that happen. And it's actually a plural word, time, plural in this sense, in the Greek. That there are periods of restoration. There's periods of reconstituting heaven and earth heaven coming to earth. Then we get times of refreshing. That word for time is kairos, a distinct word for time. It's not a synonym. Kairos of refreshing. It's a strategic or opportune time, a window of opportunity. Now just because the harvest in the field is ripe doesn't mean it'll end up in the barn. There's a window of opportunity to harvest, to pick the fruit. It doesn't actually matter that it's ripe. It's got to be picked. It's got to be stored. Kairos is that season of opportunity. We could respond to it or we could forego it. But the window is there. Yeah. 
And we can miss opportunities and windows. Jesus weeps over Jerusalem in Luke 19. He weeps over Jerusalem and he says, you did not know the time of your visitation. You did not know the kairos of your visitation. They missed it. Jesus was here. The Messiah was here. And he says, you missed it. After all the preparation, after all the seasons, after all the generations, the kairos came in Jesus and you missed it. And he weeps over Jerusalem. They didn't recognize the time. Our kairos can be a season, a short season or a long season. It can be a moment of time or it can be generations. But it's an opportune time. There's an importance of the chronos. There's an importance of the general function of time. It prepares for the opportunity. It prepares for the kairos. Sometimes it takes longer than we would expect. That's the cost of God working through imperfect people. There are a lot of things he could have done a lot better, a lot faster. But he decided he wanted to work through his kids. And in the Kronos season, there are things that he does to prepare. He prepares our hearts. He sanctifies his bride. There's prayer. There's discipleship. There's growth. And the faithfulness of the Kronos season leads to a Kairos moment. I love that God works through imperfect people because I'm one of them. In the last year and a half, there have been distinct moments where I was like, well, I blew that. And things take longer and they're harder and they take mending. But we serve a good God who says, it's worth it to work through my kids. They might not be perfect. They might not always get it right. It might take longer than expected. But he loves to faithfully walk with his kids during the chronos. And then when the opportunity comes, where the kairos comes, he loves to see his kids step out of the boat, step off the ledge, jump into his arms. So in this passage of Acts 3, what is the kairos of? It's a, a kairos of refreshing that he's talking about, Peter's preaching about. Refreshing is a Greek word, anasuksis. It's literal translation. Refreshing can mean a lot of things. It can mean a deep spiritual refreshing. It could be going to the spa on Saturday. But the, a literal translation of the Greek of this word, anasuksis, is the intense blowing of the breath again. The intense blowing of the breath again. Now remember, Peter's preaching. This is not long after Pentecost. He's preaching to all these people that have just seen a lame man walk, a lame man that had been sitting there begging for decades. He comes walking in the temple. And now he has a listening ear of all these people. And he says, do you remember a few days ago when we were in the upper room and a wind came and tongues of fire fell and a bunch of people came to see what was going on and you all thought we were drunk. We received a breath. We received a refreshing of the spirit, a blowing of the breath of God, intense blowing of the breath of God. And he's saying it's not just for us. There are times of refreshing that you can have access to if you give your life to Jesus. If you lay it down, the Kairos moment is here. The Messiah has come, and you can be refreshed through the breath of God in your life, just like we were a few days ago. Thousands respond to Peter's message. A kairos season can be missed or overlooked or rejected. 
God oftentimes gets blamed for things that were not his intention. A lot of times something is going on and we think, why would God let this happen? Or we think, we just need to trust that God knows what he's doing or this must just be how it's supposed to be. And sometimes you look at these situations, which absolutely, God, God is good and he is in control. But you look at these situations, you're like, all I see is kill, steal, destroy. Why are we assuming that God was the one that initiated the kill, steal, and destroy? It's not in his nature. It's not in his DNA. I know whose DNA it is, but it's not God's. Yes, God is powerful. He is sovereign. He is above all things. He does work things for good. But that doesn't mean that everything that happens was his initial intent. We've got some of our own skin in the game. God has chosen not to micromanage and manufacture away our ability to make choices. And with our ability to make choices, there are also messes that are not what God intended. It doesn't take away from his sovereignty. God desires that no one should perish. He has desires, but he desires something real, not something manufactured. Sometimes we blame him for the ramifications of missed opportunities or missed seasons where we haven't pressed in and obeyed. Here's an example. We talked a few weeks ago about Saul. There's a Kairos moment. God had said that he would deal with the Amalekites. The moment came. God gives Saul the orders to go and rid the land of the Amalekites. All of them. Everything. Don't take any spoils of war. Saul comes back. He did most of it, but not all of it. A Kairos moment. God was fulfilling something that he said he would fulfill. And there was disobedience. He leaves Agag alive. And if we look through scripture, Glenn was sharing this with me. If we look through scripture after that, we see the Amalekites actually spurred up in small situations. 1 Samuel 30, 1 Chronicles 4. Now that was around the time of David, which this is like 1000 BC. Let's jump ahead to about 480 BC. We'll call it 500 years later. We get to the book of Esther. Esther 3.1, a character comes on the scene named Haman. And he desires to commit genocide on the Jewish people. To get rid of all of them. In Esther 3.1, Haman is referenced as an Agagite. Now there are some that would write it off as being a Persian province or this thing, but there is... There is genuine possibility that Haman was a direct descendant of the Amalekites that Saul did not slay. Then enters the scene Mordecai. Mordecai was in the lineage of Kish. You know who Kish was? Saul's dad. 500 years later, something that was supposed to have been taken care of is now at the doorstep of the Jews And the Jews are facing potential genocide because of disobedience of 500 years before. Haman should have never been around. And there are times where we can say, God, why would you let this happen? And there are probably times where God's like, this wasn't the plan. There was a Kairos moment and there was disobedience. There was failure to walk through the window of opportunity. That's why I always say the safest place to be is the call that God has on your life. It doesn't matter how radical or dangerous or how afraid you are. The safest place to be is where God's called you. Bar none, hands down. To be exactly where he's called. It might not reap the rewards that the world looks at, but it is the safest place in the eyes of eternity to be is in our Father's arms walking in lockstep, waiting on the Lord, like we heard last week from Beverly. Yeah. Bound to him. The safest place we could be. So the most famous Kairos 
Some people say Kairos. It's actually Kairos. The most famous Kairos moment in the Bible is with the Israelites who have come out of Egypt. They've come out of slavery. They've crossed the Red Sea. They're wandering. Now from Exodus 3.8, when Moses encounters God in the burning bush, God makes it clear, I desire to bring my people out of slavery and into a land flowing with milk and honey. From the very beginning, God called out what he was doing. That's what he desires. That's what he's calling Moses to do. Crystal clear. Then God tells Moses to send spies into Canaan, and he references this is the land which I am giving the people of Israel. We've talked about this before. Which I am giving. Go send spies. Look at what I'm giving you. Moses adds to the instruction. This is what Moses said. He goes and he sends the spies. He says, go up into the Negev and go into the hill country and see what the land is and whether the people who dwell in it are strong or weak, whether they are few or many, whether the land that they dwell in is good or bad, and whether the cities they dwell in are camps or strongholds. It was irrelevant to what God said he was bringing them, them into. He had said, I'm bringing you into a land of milk and honey. I'm giving you the land. It doesn't matter whether they're strong or weak. It doesn't matter whether it's strongholds or, or camps. You already know whether the land's good or bad. But Moses adds to it, probably out of his own fear. He sends off the spies. They come back freaked out, all but two of them. All but Joshua and Caleb. Generationally, the Israelites were about to make a decision. It was a Kairos moment. God was ready to bring them into what he desired for them, what he had prepared from the beginning. And as a generation, they decided, too risky, not going to happen. We better get a leader and go back to Egypt. That's what they say. The opportunity to respond to a Kairos moment can be generationally or a body of people. It can be individually. In this case, it was a generational opportunity to step into what God had, had planned out, what he desired. Only Caleb and Joshua wanted to occupy the land. The rest of the spies, the people reject it. So this is God's response. Remember, God already said that he's calling Moses to take his people out of slavery, bring them into a land of flowing with milk, milk and honey. Numbers 14, 28 through 30. Say to them, as I live, declares the Lord, what you have said in my hearing, I will do to you. Your dead bodies shall fall in the wilderness and all your number listed in the census from 20 years old and upward who have grumbled against me. Not one shall come into the land where I swore that I would make you dwell, except Caleb and Joshua. He says, as you have said, so it will be. The opportunity was there, but he honors their decision to say no, to reject the Kairos moment. Now, as a people, God still fulfills because there was a younger generation that was raised up and responds to the Kairos moment, but it was long after. It wasn't just like a year or two past, they changed their mind and then they have a new opportunity. There's a new chronos. There's a new foundation that has to be laid before another Kairos moment opens in which Joshua is called to lead the people across the Jordan into the promised land. And it's not until they've actually, the priests have stepped in the water that the water will part. It's a little different than the parting of the Red Sea. The priests with the ark had to step in the water and then the water parted. The next Kairos moment that was long after, the window of opportunity was missed and it was a whole generation before the next window opened. Now what did God desire? He desired the first generation out of Egypt. But what happened? The first generation died in the wilderness per their request.
Sometimes we wander in the desert, not because God's keeping us there, but because we didn't respond or we didn't obey to the Kairos moment. And we're asking God, why would you do this? Why would you do this? He's saying, it's not what I wanted to do. It's not what I proposed. But sometimes we write off our own disobedience. We're very gentle with our own disobedience. And we're very straightforward with other people's disobedience. (laughs) Responding and stepping into what God has is a big deal. Because he desires to bring us into the fulfillment of his promises. He desires to bring us into the land flowing with milk and honey. But he won't tie us down and force us to go. So when you read in Joshua, when you read them responding to the Kairos moment and take the step to go into the promised land, you see a few things. There's a distinct decision that's necessary. You could be a farmer, the harvest could be ripe, everything's ready to be picked off the vine, and you could say, yeah, I'm not opposed to harvest, but I don't know, maybe tomorrow. Maybe tomorrow. I'm not against harvesting, but it's just not, it's not the greatest time right now. I've got a lot of stuff to do. You don't have to be in complete opposition to the harvest to actually miss a Kairos moment. There has to be a distinct decision. Am I going to step into what's been prepared in front of me that God is inviting me into? A distinct decision. When we step into a Kairos moment, Things change. The status quo changes. It's a new season. You know, in Joshua 5, 12, the Israelites had been eating this manna that's prepared for them at their doorstep, outside their tents, for years and years and years. You know what stopped when they walked in the promised land? Food service. (laughs) There's risk involved in Kairos moments. What God invites us into is better, but it's oftentimes harder. It's easier to get the manna that's just right outside your doorstep. But it's so much better to eat from a land flowing with milk and honey. But in the land flowing with milk and honey, there's strongholds, there's things to do, there's danger. But God had already said, I've given it to you. I'm giving it to my people. In Kairos moments, things change. There's a different status quo. It's better, but it's harder. In the stock world, the more risk you take, the more potential for reward. A CD in a bank is really safe but the reward is limited because it's really safe. There's some correlations in the kingdom of God. There are some things that are really safe that will only allow us to see a sliver of the kingdom of God. But then there are other times where you're called into the land flowing with milk and honey and there's, there's dangers everywhere. But they have the opportunity to experience the kingdom of God in a far greater way than if they just keep wandering in the wilderness. Even though it's normal, it's safe, it's convenient to them, it's better, but it's harder to go into the promised land. And lastly, in a Kairos season, in a window of opportunity, there's acceleration. Where things begin to happen supernaturally at a faster pace things that you didn't have the capability of before, God gives you the grace to walk in it because he knows you're in over your head. He knows when you respond and you say, yes, I'll step out into the better things you have, even though it's harder and it's way over my head. He's like, I can take care of the equipping. I can take care of your capability. If you yield to me, if you yield to my spirit inside you, I can take care of those things. 
But what I need is your decisive decision. I need to know that you're in it and that it's something real, that you're in it because you've decided to step into the Kairos moment. Kronos and Kairos. We don't get the Kairos moment without the faithfulness of the Kronos season. You don't get the harvest if no seeds have been planted, if nothing's been watered, if the ground hasn't been tended to. They're both necessary, but I believe we've stepped into a Kairos moment in this city. We talked about there's opportunities for groups of people like the Israelites, and then there's opportunities and windows that can be personal to us, and sometimes those play into each other. They absolutely do. I look back over the last 10 years of my life. I don't have as much history as other people do, but in the last 10 years, I've seen God take me on some adventures I would never consider. And those things that I would never consider have turned out to be the most powerful determining factors of my growth in Christ. When I came out of college, God said, go to India for a couple months. I had zero desire to go to India for a couple months. There are tons of places I would love to go, and India was not one of them. I'm just being totally transparent. I go, I say yes, and for two months... I got absolutely beat up in the spiritual places. I experienced spiritual warfare like I'd never seen in my life. I came out of that trip like feeling more broken than I even went when I met. Like the confidence of what I had put confidence in was stripped away, yet I came out with, with something significant. I came out with the recognition of what my identity is in Christ. What I thought I could lean on, what I thought I could be confident in, got stripped away, brutally stripped away. And I was on my face for most of the trip in the presence of God, crying out to God, because I, I knew at that point in my life, there's nothing that I can do without him. The enemy will tear me apart if I put my confidence in anything or anyone else. And I felt like so much had been stripped away, and yet I had come away with something that would radically change the next 10 years of my life. My identity in Christ and the knowledge of how to walk in victory against any power of the enemy. There was a time after that, a few years later, I was working a job that I loved. I absolutely loved it. I was working at Grand Canyon University. I was working with athletes who I loved, an incredible setup. And then one day in January, I was with the Lord and he says, it's time to move on. This was supposed to be my dream job. <laughs> I wept. There's nothing in me that would have made that decision. But he said, it's time to move on. So I started to apply. Not only that, but I started to apply and nothing was coming back. So I'm like, God, you told me to do this. Can't you just throw me a bone with a job opportunity? <laughs> One came. There was zero pay. It was an internship halfway across the country in Milwaukee. I thought, are you kidding me? So I took it to the Lord. I was seeking the Lord. And the Lord was really specific. He wasn't forcing me to go. But he says, I have gifts stored up for you in Milwaukee. If you want to seek them out, they're there. So I said, all right. I quit my job. Put in my notice. Started planning out provisions for moving across the country. Two weeks before I left, my boss, the director of our department, got removed unexpectedly, just politics, politics in the athletic department. And then by the end of that summer, like half of those whom I loved and worked with were gone. 
God was like, if you listen to me, I'll save you from a tragic situation. And in, in Milwaukee, God deposited things in me that I would never trade. But it wasn't apparent right away. I got to Milwaukee. The night I got there, my housing had fallen through. The city was not what I expected it to be. Plans weren't going. And I literally thought to myself, I've made a horrible mistake. That was my thought my first night in Milwaukee. But today I would never trade what God ended up doing in Milwaukee in my life. Same with coming to Washington. You guys know, most of you guys know that story. It was never something I would do, but there are certain moments where God says it's an opportune time if you'll respond. And I've come to the place in my life where if God makes it clear, if he presents an opportunity, I know I want it. If he prompts an opportunity, I know I want it. It doesn't matter what it looks like. It doesn't matter how crazy it seems. I'm all in because I've seen him be faithful over and over with the things that don't make sense. He deserves our trust. And when we step into the Kairos moments, we'll realize he had more for us than we even realized. Through all the things that didn't make sense that we couldn't see through, we'll get to the other side and realize, I'm so glad I said yes to Jesus. A number of months ago, we were in the unplugged service on Sunday nights. And the presence of God came so thick, but in, in a way that I had never personally experienced before. It was just a very unique sweetness to his presence. And we were pressing in. I think, I think Mark was supposed to preach, and, and he, we didn't end up having him preach because it was just God was doing something in the room. And as I'm there before the Lord, the Lord said, Seth, you've gone through, you stepped through the door, coming to Washington. And it was hard, and it was chaotic, and it was challenging, it stretched. It was a Kairos moment. But now we've come to a place where we have a decision to make. We saw God move. What the transition that happened with Anthony moving to Wisconsin statistically should have led to a 40% fallout of our church. Statistically, when there's a founding pastor or a pastor that's been somewhere for a very long time, statistically, 40% of you all should have fallen away. But God's favor and God's goodness was so evident, what he was doing was so evident, that he brought us through the chaos of what we didn't no, the, un the, the uncertainty of the situation. And he said, Seth, now you've come to a decision point. You can continue to coast. You've seen the supernatural. You can continue to coast in what is now comfortable. It wasn't comfortable before, but now it's becoming comfortable. Or you can press in for more. That he's willing to take us another layer deeper. But he said, it'll cost you everything. It's like Beverly said last week, salvation is free, but consecration will cost you everything. Laying it all down before the Lord. He said, Seth, you could very well stay in the new comfort that's developed, or you could press in, and I have levels deeper that I would, I would like to take you guys, but it'll cost you everything. I'm going to invite Pastor Barry up. We're in a Kairos moment. You can see the things going on around us. You can see the things shifting. You can see ground breaking. I've started every day, every day, I ask the Holy Spirit to baptize me with fire. Every day. I'm like, I don't, I don't care what I've experienced in the past. I, I need more. I want more. I want more of his word. I want more of his presence. I want to be more fully surrendered to him. Holy Spirit, would you come today and baptize me with fire? Because everything he is is worth it. 
Everything in his word is worth it. And I've realized that nothing in this city will change without a move of the spirit of God. There's no might and there's no power. There's nothing we can do that will change this city apart from the spirit of God moving. It's our only shot. It's the only way. We can look busy, but we can't do anything without the spirit of God moving on on this city's behalf, on our behalf. We can do a lot of programs, we can do a lot of events, we can do a lot of activities, but we need the Spirit of God to move if this city is ever going to change. And I believe that that time is now. I believe the foundation's been laid. But we don't seek the Spirit of God as if, all right, I'm just going to sit back and wait for Him to do something and bring me along. We see the Spirit of God move because of radical pursuit of His heart. And radical obedience to what he says. Radical pursuit of his heart and radical obedience. Radical yielding to his spirit. You watch any sporting event. When it gets to overtime, when the ball's on the goal line, everything escalates. When it's fourth down, it's the end of the game. And someone's on the one-yard line playing football trying to get a touchdown to win the game. It doesn't matter how tired you are. It doesn't matter what's going on in the game. It all comes down to this moment. A window of opportunity that one team, one team is going to overcome the other. And we know which team. But there's this moment of pressing in. Everything's escalated. Everything's intensified. It's the same when we're close to receiving Jesus. I was talking with a guy. I was a guy back in Arizona. He was was close to giving his life to Christ. He was coming out of all kinds of trauma, all kinds of strongholds. And I told him, being in the middle ground is the worst place to be. Because right now the devil knows that if you, if you give your life to Christ, it's over for him. Everything escalates. And he was seeing all kinds of attack of the enemy and everything. I was like, for your sake, you got to make a decision one way or the other. If you're just standing on the goal line, it's the worst place to be. The enemy's just going to tear you apart because he knows if you punch it through that goal line, he's done. The enemy knows opportune times. The enemy knows Kairos moments. He knows when it's on the goal line. And if the body of Christ pushes through, he knows what God wants to release. And he'll do anything. He'll he'll spike the heat. He'll go after people to try and get, do anything he can to get them to not step through that goal line, to not step into that opportunity. When I first moved to Seattle, I could tell a distinct difference from Phoenix, just a a closed off mentality. I would meet people, I'd minister to people outside these walls, and there was just, there's a callousness, there's a hardness. A pastor I had a long time ago, he would say, He'd teach us to seek the Holy Spirit to find ripe fruit. You could spend all your time on hard hard places. You could put all your time and attention to ground that's just not soft. When all the while there are other people who are just waiting for hope. That God's been tending to their hearts, their hearts are soft. And we miss them sometimes because we're so hyper-focused on another thing. But I came here to Seattle and it, it just seemed cold and hard hard hearts. Now in the last six months, it's probably a variety of things. God just softening my heart and teaching. But now most people I come across are very soft hearted. There's just a distinct shift. People who we've thought like, oh, they would never, they would never be interested in Jesus. I challenge you, go to them. You might just find that the Holy Spirit's been working and softening ground in areas that you've just written off. Look for ripe fruit in this season. 
Follow the ripe fruit. Follow the Spirit. Ask the Spirit to reveal to you what He's doing around you. He'll lead you to ripe fruit. And it might not look exactly like what your natural eyes see. We have to see through His eyes. We have to have discernment in the Spirit. He knows what He's doing in people's hearts. There is soft ground all over this city. A couple weeks ago, I was praying in the morning. I asked, Lord, would you give divine encounter, divine appointments? I go to this coffee shop. I'm going to get some work done. I order my coffee, and I'm sliding in to sit down. And before I even sit down, I hear someone say something to me. So I sit down, and I look, and it's a guy about my age. And he commented on my hat. I was wearing a Phoenix Suns hat. And without even trying, it opened this conversation. And we start talking. He grew up five miles from me. He talks about moving to Seattle. And then I asked him what he does. He said he's in between jobs, but I'm just trading stocks right now. I was like, you've been set up, my friend. <laughs> I didn't say that to him, but in my heart, I'm like, oh, my goodness. God brought me someone that is like a soft toss for the gospel. So we only talk five or six minutes, but we're grabbing coffee this week. And you just see the Holy Spirit's fingers on it because you're like, that's far beyond coincidence. But God desires to lead us to ripe fruit. He desires to lead us to soft hearts. If we'll soften our hearts to actually step into what he's doing. There's another guy that I'm hopefully meeting this week that was a, a checker at the grocery store. There's another guy who's a waiter at a restaurant nearby. There's another guy who I was rock climbing with some friends at this outdoor rock climbing park, and he just yelled from his car, and he said, hey, that's really cool. So I thought, well, that's an easy way to start a conversation. <laughs> Find out he's going through all kinds of things, but his heart is so soft for Jesus. And there was a day a few weeks ago, I was sitting at Starbucks. And someone came up and started a conversation with me. Again, a guy my age. Most of these guys are my age. Because I believe God wants to actually use us in the context. He can use us with anyone. But when we step into what he's doing, he wants us to use, to use us in the context of how he's wired us. So all of a sudden, there's just all these young men that are popping out of nowhere with soft hearts. He comes up to me at Starbucks, starts a conversation. He goes, you seem like a cool guy. Could we exchange numbers? <laughs> sure. And now he's, he's genuinely a good friend of mine. Loves Jesus. He already loved, he's, he already was coming from a Christian background. But just these divine encounters. A guy at my uh, apartment complex, quite frankly, he hates Christianity. And God's like, hey, why don't you meet a pastor? And so we go to lunch and we talk about the things that he's pressing into and wrestling with and struggling with and things that he's, he's trying to see. He's looking for truth. But I see whenever someone is genuinely looking for truth, I know that it only can end up one place. If they're willing to go and follow truth, no matter what it costs, I know it'll end up at one place. So we just go out to lunch from time to time and we talk about all the stuff that's going on and I share Jesus and he shares the things he's looking into and researching. But there's been such a trust that's developed. Most of the time people aren't offended with Jesus. They've usually had an experience with people that have given them a stereotype. But I just keep faithfully just serving up the heart of Jesus. And he's not a believer yet but he's searching for truth. And there comes this moment where discipleship is so inconvenient. And I think we need to just come to terms with that. Discipleship is so inconvenient. Let's, let's just get over that part. It will always be inconvenient. There are times where one of those guys will call me up and it doesn't matter if I've called him five times, it'll be the one time that is the worst time for me to talk that he'll call me up. And I have to think, discipleship's not convenient. And take the call. And whatever he's going through, you're walking him through. You're doing life with him. 
Because that's a moment in his life. He's going through something and God wants to do something in his life. And we just, if that's what the Holy Spirit's doing, let's walk him through that. It's inconvenient. But there's no greater joy than discipling. I know there's a lot of different stereotypes and perspectives on discipleship. There's nothing more life-giving than discipleship, than walking with someone who is encountering the heart of Jesus for the first time. And you don't need a bunch of qualifications and education to say, hey, I'm following Jesus. Do you want to come with me while I learn more about him, while I press deeper? To just say, this is where I'm at. I don't have to figure it all out. I don't have all the answers, but come with me. Walk with me. Let's figure it out together. In this Kairos moment, it's time for the body of Christ to be all in. The body of Christ has been through a lot in the last few years. It's been sifted. It's been scattered. There are some who are just floating from place to place, not really planted anywhere. The body of Christ has been shaken. I think in a lot of cases, the purpose of the body of Christ in gathering together has been diluted because the enemy doesn't want the body of Christ actually pressing into what it's called to. It just becomes, ah, I'll go when I can if it's not convenient, or this church has this thing and that church has that thing, and I'm just going to kind of float in and out, back and forth. Whatever seems to fit best in that moment. We have the opportunity to recognize and respond to the harvest that is right outside our doorstep. And you might be thinking, I'm just way too busy to be all in. I guarantee you the last time a Kairos moment opened up, you were probably too busy. And the next time, you'll be busy. That won't change. There's the opportunity to put busyness aside. It might mean changing what we put our time to, but put busyness aside, because it'll always be there if we let it, and press in, in the window of opportunity. You might be saying, I can't be all in because I'm just not prepared. I need to learn more things. I guarantee you the last time there was a Kairos moment, you were unprepared. This time you're unprepared. Next time you'll be unprepared. So let's just put that to rest and say, hey, it's a good time to press in. You might be thinking like, I, I just don't really do well with change. I, I like the routine. I like keeping things status quo. You'll like that at the next Kairos moment too. But there's a joy in putting the status quo aside and saying, I want to step into what's better, even if it's harder. Go ahead and stand with me. This is the time. The time is now. And it's an honor to get to step through Kairos moments with the Lord. The fact that he would open up opportunities for us to carry the baton with his spirit inside of us.
Yes, he could do it way better himself. He could have done it way faster. He could do it in ways that are above and beyond what we could ever dream. But he comes to us in certain distinct seasons and he says, will you step through with me? Will you make the decision that it's harvest time? Will you make the decision that the time is now, the window is now, that we can be a part of our Father's business? How incredible is that? That he's welcomed us into what he's doing, his kingdom, his purposes. He welcomes us into the thing he's doing around us. And he says, this is the time, the harvest is plentiful. The harvest is ripe. It's not a harvest problem. It's a worker's problem. The workers are few. And we've been conditioned to think that, oh, that's for someone else, or that's really hard, or we have stereotypes. Being a worker in our father's har harvest is one of the greatest honors that we could ever respond to. One of the greatest honors to see someone who is dead and now they're alive who is encountering the heart of the Father for the first time, prodigals who have never truly encountered the Spirit of God and the heart of Jesus, encountering him for the first time. There is nothing greater. And he's giving us an opportunity today to step into that. But you might be thinking, that sounds great but I don't feel it. There's nothing in my heart. The beautiful thing about that is the Holy Spirit gives us the fire. He's not just saying, I want you to conjure up an emotion. He's saying, if you yield to me, if you submit to me, I'll light the fire. Let's just take a moment with eyes closed. If you're in that place where you're like, it all sounds great, but I just feel like there's no fire in my heart, would you be courageous and raise your hand? I want to pray for you. So Jesus, I thank you that you're igniting fires in my brothers' and sisters' hearts right now. I thank you that it's not by might and not by power, but it's by your spirit, God. That all you ask for is a yielded heart. All you ask for is someone yielded to your spirit. God, I thank you for right now imparting fire to each one of their hearts. that you would pierce through any past experiences, you'd pierce through any way that the enemies attacked them or beat them down. I pray that you would infuse the life and life abundantly that you paid for on the cross. I still with eyes closed. If you feel like you haven't been planted you haven't really taken that step to plant yourself and present yourself to the Lord. Maybe you've been floating, maybe you've been going here and there, come and go. But this morning you're saying, I wanna be planted. I wanna be planted and allow the Spirit of God to bring about the harvest in my life, the fruit in my life that comes through the true vine. If you're saying today, I wanna plant myself, I want to press in. I want to be all in. Would you raise your hand? So God, I thank you for my brothers and sisters who today are saying, I'm stepping in. I'm pressing in. I'm planting myself. God, I thank you for all that you have in store, all that you're going to lead my brothers and sisters in, for all that you're doing. I thank you that you're revealing the adventure and the honor of walking with you, God, being planted. Now, everyone, if you just want more, I just encourage you to put your hands out. We're just going to receive from the Lord.
God, we recognize the Kairos moment that you're inviting us into. We recognize the season. God, would you break off any callousness of our heart that would cause us to be like Jerusalem and miss the season? We want your eyes, we want your discernment to recognize the days and the seasons, God. The days and the seasons in this city. We thank you for what you've prepared in the season of the Kronos. Thank you for ground that you've broken. Thank you for seeds that you've planted. Thank you for things that you've watered. Thank you for raising us up. Thank you for tending to your bride, for purifying your bride. But God, we say yes to stepping into this Kairos moment in, in our city. This opportunity for heaven to invade earth, for heaven to invade the city through your ambassadors, through your kids. God, we know that nothing can happen apart from your spirit. This city cannot be changed. It has to be through your spirit. God, would you baptize us with fire? Would you ignite our hearts? Would you immerse us with your spirit, God? We've come to the end of thinking that we can just make things happen in our own strength. We need the spirit of God upon us. Would you come and would you immerse us? We say yes to this moment. We say yes to this season. And we know that even the opportunity to say yes is through what you've given us through your spirit. Even our ability to step through into the Kairos opportunity, the Kairos window, is the grace of your spirit upon us. The grace of the blood of Jesus that covers our life. And so we say yes, God. We say yes, God. We would you take us deeper even if it costs us everything? Because you're worth it, God. Your way is worth it, God. We say yes. Let's sing together.
Jesus, we thank you that you're here. We thank you that you've called us by name. That you've invited us into this very season. Would you ignite our hearts like we've never experienced? Would you ignite this city like we've never seen? Would you radically transform this region like nobody would ever dream? We say yes, God, in Jesus' name, amen.